Hello, everyone. So Roscoe and I are going to talk to you about a few things we're doing. I, I've, I've worked with a few companies, as, as she mentioned, in, uh, on Wall Street, between Wall Street and Silicon Valley. So had some observations, first of all, about the difference in the cultures and why we're able to do uh, what we do here. It's so basically in the, let's figure this out. There we go. In the, in the 1960s and 1970s, it's a really important context to remember, just 40 years ago, Wall Street really didn't solve very many hard problems. It was basically a deal-driven culture that was dominated by middlemen. So basically, you got a bunch of old boy networks sitting around the table, and it wasn't about hard problems. It was about being exposed to deals, getting deals done. And you know, eventually, some people said, well, there's lots of data here, and we should, maybe should hire some really smart people and solve some hard problems. And they said, no, that's silly. That's, that's not really how we do things here. But some people did that anyway. And pretty quickly, the mathematicians kind of took over Wall Street in the 1980s, and everyone making money was a mathematician. And that was a really big theme. And, and eventually, you had like, tons of data flying around, and you got really complicated information systems. And if you think about it, like, that's really what finance is. It's like a bunch of data, a really hard information system. That's something that computer scientists are really good at. So come the 90s, really, computer scientists became the dominant and started taking over lots of different parts of Wall Street. And that was mostly done from New York, though, because the guys in New York, they knew what the really hard problems were. So even though we're really good here in Silicon Valley, at having a better technical culture, at solving really hard problems. Most of the time, we don't really know what those really hard problems are. It's kind of esoteric. And so, so Wall Street still kind of stayed dominant. But slowly over time, like our culture kind of has seeped into there. And we're starting to solve some of their really hard problems. So of course, you look at the difference between us and them. New York's really a very much a deal-driven culture. So in New York, you have lots of events that are happening. And they're monetizing these events. And that, that, that's what works. Whereas in Silicon Valley, you're kind of sitting down and solving a hard problem over time and building value over a long period of time which is very different. And similarly in New York, based on that, like you care about like getting something done. So in New York, you'll like cludge the technology together, like who cares, let's just like make it work and stick everything together. Whereas in Silicon Valley, it's a lot more about the technology itself. So things have to be elegant. Like we're a bunch of artists here in a sense, right? It's like if it's a, it has to be a beautiful solution. That's a big part of who we are. It's a very big difference between the two. And similarly in New York, like because you're getting things done, you're thinking like, how am I going to make this work? You know, if you think a year ahead in New York, that's like long-term planning. That's amazing because everyone's kind of like, how are we going to make the quarter work? Whereas in Silicon Valley, the culture, the whole culture centered around we're building this over three, five, seven years. And that's a, a very, very different approach to business. And so what it means is that now, as the problems are getting really hard and you need new systems, a lot of those systems are going to be built by people in Silicon Valley because we actually are the only ones that have a culture that's going to be able to make that work. And one of the most important things about that culture is the idea of iteration and improvement on anything we're building. So in New York, they still have the fantasy where they'll say, we need this problem solved. Here's a spec. Like, call the guy in India and like, send it back to us when you're done. And that's, like, that's how you do technology there. And as most of you know from Silicon Valley, that's not how it works. You don't actually know ahead of time exactly how to solve the problem. You've got to keep building it, keep iterating. And then the substance is like, how do you have a really great technology team that can iterate quickly? And that's how you build value. And so it's a very, very different approach to these things. Uh, one of the other kind of core things, and this is something that applies to both sides, is how do people work on problems and how do machines work on problems? Like, what should the machine be doing? What should the person be doing? And this is a mistake that both sides tend to make, is you think, oh, this is a hard problem. We're going to replace the person with technology here. And you're going to see a lot of different people talking today who are building tech companies or replacing people. And sometimes that's the good answer. But a lot more of the time, the technology should be complementing the person. The question is, what are the machines good at? And then what are the high-level conceptual tasks people are good at? And how do they work together on that? And Roscoe's going to give an, an example of that. But so in summary, here in Silicon Valley, like, we're much more interested in a culture that's long-term, solving really, really hard, big problems. And I personally, as someone from Silicon Valley, I think it's really cool to work on these problems on Wall Street because you know, any, any, these things are affecting our whole economy. And some people think, yeah, a billion dollars is, is cool. But what's really cool is a trillion dollar problem. And, that, and there's a lot of those right now in Wall Street that we're working on. And a few examples of those, a global wealth management is an area, I've, the infrastructure that powers that, that I've been spending a lot of time on. A big company doing things there. Um, global project finance is another multi-trillion dollar problem. How do you get the money to the right infrastructure and in emerging economies to fix them? There's a, you know, Zimbardo and other companies doing some really amazing things there. And finally, here at home, Palantir solved uh, one of the most important problems in the world that's actually really applicable to the US. And Ross is going to tell you what we did with that. There you go. So I find myself in the boardroom of one of the largest and oldest financial institutions in the world. And sitting on one side of the, board, of the, of the table is um, a motley band of nerds. Um, and across from us is a, a team of well-dressed, middle-aged IT executives. 
And uh, at the end of the table is the CIO who, who called this meeting together. Um, and we're, the matter at hand that we were discussing is uh, what, what is the solution to the home lending crisis and how are we going to solve it? And um, um, so we, the, as, as the Silicon Valley, in the, Sil in the Sil Silicon Valley tradition, uh, we went in and we did demo or die. We had this, this product that was working. We were iterating and, and working on their, so on, on, on their actual data. And uh, when we finished the demo, we thought we did really, really well. Um, but then uh, we turned it over to the, the IT, the incumbent IT uh, executives, and they presented a roadmap. So they had a PowerPoint deck, and they were like, well, some of these things are good. Some of them we have already. Um, and we're going to build a best of breed in house solution. Um, and, um, and at the end of the meeting, the, the, the CIO mm, puts down his Blackberry and looks at, looks at the nerds and looks at the, the guys in the suits, looks at us one more time, and then looks at the guys in the suits and says, Huh, I think I get it. Do you think your role is more mechanical or creative? And we'll get to the answer to that question in a minute, but uh, first let's jump into the problem at hand. Um, supposed to be on there? Okay, so this is, this is the, uh, the, the US um, mortgage system and, and, uh, and uh, housing system are undergoing historic changes. The, the house at the top is what the entire industry used to look like. It's a high quality owner who owns a property that is in good condition. And uh, the mortgage industry basically amounted to cashing checks and sending out monthly statements. Um, the landscape has changed dramatically and you now have millions of people in foreclosure. Um, and you also have millions of people who are underwater on their houses, which means they owe more on their house than their house is actually worth. Uh, and this fundamentally changes the way that we need to think about the problem. And looking at it from a macro scale, um, there are six million people who are in delinquency or foreclosure. If there's one number to remember from this presentation, that's the number. There is, including people who are underwater, that grows to 11 million people, which is one in four households. And this doesn't include second liens. Estimates including second liens go up as high as one in three. And looking at it, uh, take, looking at it from the economic perspective, if we take just the smallest amount of money that uh, wealth destruction is gonna, gonna happen here, uh, there's $700 billion in negative equity uh, for the underwater homeowners. And uh, simply the foreclosure costs that, that we know for foreclosing on that on six million people would be about $317 billion which uh, conveniently adds up to $1 trillion. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, okay, so it's not only a big problem, it also affects all of us. Homer Simpson was foreclosed on when he used his house as an ATM machine and said, I've, I've come up with an ingenious plan. I can, I, can, I can spend this money, my house has to pay it back. Um, <laughs> Uh, O.J. Simpson, O.J. Simpson's house in, in Miami went into foreclosure last month. Uh, and don't worry about it, the local elected officials know what to do about it. The, uh, the mayor of North Miami is also in foreclosure because he's underwater. Um, and this isn't just a problem for celebrities, this affects, uh, uh, this affects all of us too. I'm sure many of the people in this room either know people or, ha or have been personally impacted by foreclosure. And, um, mm, uh, so this is not only a really big problem, and it impacts everyone, um, <laughs> but, who, but who wins? So there's a trillion dollars of wealth that's going to be destroyed, and looking at it on the micro level of one household going into foreclosure, who wins? Well, the homeowner certainly doesn't win. The bank loses about $60,000. The community doesn't win, and the, you, know, you as taxpayers are ultimately footing the bill for many of these, these uh, foreclosures. So um, nobody wins, and that's kind of crazy to me, uh, and we're going to get to the bottom of that, hopefully, in this talk. Um, so let's look at the state of the art. Uh, this is a testimony last month by uh, the person who heads the, the, the agency that oversees the agencies that own most of the, the mortgages in America. And he basically is making the claim that uh, the correct way to solve this problem is to do payment reductions instead of forgiving principal and, and bringing people back above water on their houses. And as the data that he, he cites in his analysis, in, in the actual testimony that you can download, uh, you look at these two tables. And uh, this is, uh, the, the big difference here is between 19% and 28%. But the bigger difference to me is, uh, we're looking at loan to value as uh, an indicator of, of, how, of how, you, how to make the best decisions for a 
trillion dollar portfolio. And if you actually look at the entire analytics industry in the mortgage space, they only really look at three or four numbers. Loan to value, debt to income, and FICO score. And if you actually read his footnotes in this testimony, he says, well, we didn't have current loan to value, so we just adjusted the origination loan to value by, uh, by our, our, our home price index. And then he says, well, if we, didn't, we don't have current FICOs, so we used origination FICOs. Uh, so the, the biggest challenge in the mortgage space is that all the systems are closed. There's literally mainframe systems that, that run the back end of these, um, these, these mortgage processing um, enterprises, and all the systems are closed. And um, dude, what? How could we be uh, making, uh, and Silicon Valley, the, the great news is that Silicon Valley is really good at this type of problem, We're really good at dealing with scale, We're really good at integrating data from a lot of different environments, and, and surfacing patterns in that data in a way that it makes it really meaningful to a human analyst. Uh, so now we're gonna jump into um, what we actually did and what got us to the boardroom. And so we started, as, as Joe kind of described, there were these systems that were kludged together, and our approach is to uh, not replace those systems, but build a layer on top of those systems that kind of abstracts away where data is coming from and uh, gets away from the bits and the bytes on the disk and turns it into conceptual concepts. So I actually care about what are all the things that I know about homeowners and what are all the things I know about neighborhoods. And so we take these bits and bytes and uh, allow anyone in the enterprise to integrate that data and end up with more conceptual uh, first order objects that you can deal with directly. Then, um, once you have that, we need search and discovery to, to, to learn, to discover new patterns, and um, collaboration is a really big part of this. Nobody can solve this problem on their own. Uh, these teams and these individuals actually have to really work together to understand this complicated data. Um, so, uh, when we finished integrating this, our, the next thing we had to do is get humans using our system and actually trying to f understand what was going on and where we were going wrong. And so, uh, well, we can just go into it. We actually ended up figuring out some massive inefficiencies in how they were, how, in how current foreclosure alternatives work, and we could go into a few of those now. So, the first thing um, that we can start with is this whole idea of summarizing people by three or four numbers. It turns out that everybody who's in some, who's, who's in distress has a story, and understanding what are the, what are the factors that influence that story can be summarized as something like a FICO, which hasn't changed in 40 years, the way that you compute it. And um, I think of this really as personalization. So when you, when you order a film on Netflix or, or you go to YouTube, there's this really rich uh, personalization layer that, that Web 2.0 and, and Silicon Valley is built in, on top of user experience. But mortgages are essentially a one size fits, the mortgage alternative, mortgage foreclosure alternatives are a one size fits all solution. You either qualify or you don't. And so by tailoring solutions to everything that we know about the individual, about the property, about the hardship that they're going through, and about um, the, how, how poorly the neighborhood is doing, we can actually dramatically increase the efficiency of, of getting people into, into and succeeding in these foreclosure alternatives. Uh, the next thing that we discovered is time. So if you imagine you put yourself in the shoes of, a, of a, one homeowner, when you go 30 days delinquent or 60 days delinquent, if, you're, if it takes you another 60 days to get some sort of foreclosure alternative paperwork exchanged in the mail, and then it takes another 60 days for that, for that to get approved, at this point, you're, you're six months delinquent, and the, the, every, every day that you wait, the probability of successfully completing this thing goes down. Um, and making sense of the data. It turns out that there's all kinds of nefarious people out there who are, who are and, and groups and networks. Anywhere there's a trillion dollars, there's gonna be organized crime. And just surfacing this data also allowed us to pull apart who's gaming the system and essentially take them, take them out of the, the queue that was jamming up the system and put them in special queues to say, Let, let's deal with this, this challenge. And finally, what we noticed is that even if, you, even if you controlled for all the economics and you gave somebody an offer that made a lot of economic sense, sometimes people didn't take it. And an example of this is there are 50% of, 50 of people who are in foreclosure in the judicial states are more than two years delinquent. And at some point in that process, communication broke down and they literally don't respond to letters, they don't answer the, they don't answer the phone, they might have changed their address to an address that doesn't exist, so if you let the process go on too long, it actually turns into an adversarial relationship, and so you can't actually, um, you can't actually get them into a foreclosure alternative. Um, and which brings me to uh, the Computer History Museum, Museum of Computer History, and this is uh, John von Neumann. So he was a mathematician, a child prodigy, and 
Uh, he believed that real world problems couldn't be solved by classical approaches like calculus, and he really had to build numerical techniques and numerical machinery to answer real world problems. So he did. And he was also an avid poker player. Uh, and he was particularly in interested in the human tactics of deceit and cooperation. And as any math geek would, he built a, a rigorous system of analysis and, and formalized these into what is now known as game theory. And the prisoner's dilemma is one famous example of game theory where um, you might all be familiar with it, but uh, the, clearly the best outcome is for both, play both players, A and B, to cooperate. They, oh, sorry, the, the prisoner's dilemma is where two people are Two people are charged with a crime, they're put in different rooms, and they're offered the same deal. And you're given basically one choice, defect or cooperate. And the payoffs are in this matrix, and if both people cooperate, you both, you both do very well. And the worst outcome is if both, of you, uh, both, if both of you defect on each other, you both get 20 years, so that's a 40 year sentence. And the alternative is if, if one person defects, then, then you actually do better than the other person. And the really interesting thing about the prisoner's dilemma is that it's a dilemma because you can't actually get out of it. Rational people can always better their own position if they don't know the, the choice that the other player is making. So if player B ch chooses cooperate, then player A can choose between one year and parole. So of course he'll choose defect. And if player B chooses defect, then player A has the same outcome. He would rather get 20 years than life in prison. So rational people end up with a solution that's the, that's the worst outcome for everyone. Let's look at the mortgage crisis through this lens. So in the upper left, we can see um, homeowners who are getting saved, who are cooperating, the banks and the homeowners, or the, 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 the regulars, everyone is cooperating together and you're successfully completing a foreclosure alternative. At the top right, we can see, suppose the bank tried to defect and tried to, tried to, tried to game the system and, and foreclose too early on the homeowner or not, not go through the proper processes. I would call that, ro you know, one example of that is robo-signing. Um, and that's clearly, um, the hammer has come down on, on those types of practices. If the homeowner tries to defect and basically we can imagine a world where they just all, we take all the houses away from the banks and give them to the homeowners. That would be the, the Occupy Wall Street solution. And we're actually ending up in the, in the, the bottom right quadrant, which is uh, both people end up defecting and you end up in foreclosure. And so the really interesting thing here is that finally those what moments earlier aren't so confusing. They actually make sense. People are acting rationally according to their own best interests. And in, if instead of looking at this in the entire mortgage market, if you look at it as Instead of one, a one trillion dollar problem, look at a six million two player games. That's exactly what we did. And if you align incentives, then each player is gonna do the right thing. Um, and this brings me to the closer. Um, the, the, the one size fits all solutions to foreclosure alternatives clearly don't work. There's no way for us to make informed decisions about six million people using three or four numbers and showing simple tables about what the right alternative is. Um, and the good news is that, um, Wrong page. Right, so back to the boardroom in 20 seconds. So he looked over at them and said, is your job creative or mechanical? And actually he said, well, I guess it's mechanical. And so uh, the CIO looked back at us and gave us a wink. And that's the question that I want to pass to you guys as you look at all the hardest problems in the world or, or the problems that you're working on, is do you consider your role to be mechanical or creative? And do we need mechanical or creative solutions?